Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's session of Columbia Energy Straight Talk. <clears throat> My name is David Hill. I'm an adjunct senior research scholar at Columbia University's Center on Global Energy Policy. Let me quickly say that this event is being webcast live and the full video will be available online in the coming days. Today, we're gonna to be discussing uh, recent events in Texas and what they mean for electric markets, consumers, and the energy transition. A lot already has been said about this, but in many cases, the commentary seems to be people or can be people delivering their pre-prepared uh, talking points on some things. Um, they sort of seem to be saying what, uh, what they've been, that, that they've actually been right about so many things all along um, and um, even before the event, recent events in Texas. Anyway, we'll hope today's uh, session lives up to its name of having a little bit of straight talk about all of this. And I think we have the perfect guest for that today. As a reminder, for those of you joining via Zoom, you can submit a question at any time by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. During our session last month, we got a lot more questions we, than we were able to answer, but uh, please submit them um, and we'll uh, get to as many as, as we possibly can today. Uh, with that, let me introduce my good friend and distinguished visiting fellow at Columbia's Center on Global Energy Policy, former FERC Chair Cheryl LaFleur. Thank you very much, David. And we actually increased the time of this from 60 to 90 minutes to give us a chance to take more questions. So hopefully we will run the program in a way that we can. I do think we have a great topic and a great guest today. As everyone knows, for the past month, the talk of the energy world has been the events of Texas in mid-February. And I'm just going to give a brief recap to get us started of the operating events that triggered the crisis. I certainly won't try to go into the backdrop and aftermath and all that. But over a brief period in the very wee hours of February 15th, the ERCOT interconnection experienced the rapid loss of more than 40 gigawatts of generation, mostly natural gas, but lesser amounts of wind, coal, and nuclear generation as well. They had plenty of power plants, but they either couldn't get fuel to the plants or couldn't operate because of other consequences of the freezing weather, which was unprecedented in how cold it was and how long the cold weather lasted. And that included frozen gas delivery equipment, wind turbine blades, coal piles, and frozen water lines for a nuclear unit. These numerous outages and rapid succession made the system frequency drop to unsustainable levels. So in order to stabilize the system and avoid losing the whole grid, ERCOT was forced to very rapidly, really instantly shed 10 gigawatts of load proportionally from across the state and ultimately about double that over the next few hours affecting more than 4 million customer locations. And of course, when electric companies talk about customers, they mean meters. That's probably three times that many human beings. The idea was that those would be rolling blackouts to help stabilize the system, but the cascading loss of the electric network, natural gas compressors and water treatment facilities and the continued cold weather led to prolonged electric and water outages. And while there's been a lot of geeky talk about market design and out, you know, specifics of the system, it's very important to forget that, not to forget that this caused a great deal of human suffering, dozens of deaths, human mystery and misery and health dangers from lack of water and electricity and loss of property due to frozen water pipes and ruined food and manufacturing products. So there's an awful lot to unpack here, both for Texas itself, but also for all regions of the country and the world, all of which are increasingly subject to severe and difficult to predict weather and challenging operating conditions of different types. We're very lucky to have with us a terrific person to help unpack what happened, what we can learn, and what we should do next. Allison Silverstein, I believe she'll magically appear on your screen, is a nationally recognized expert on energy systems, technologies, and reliability. She's been a Texan for the past 25 years, and she served as an advisor to Chairman Pat Wood, both at FERC and at the Texas PUC, and was a lead author of the US-Canada report on the 2003 blackout. She's advised governments and private parties on all kinds of tough energy issues, including testifying at the House Energy Committee just yesterday on what we can learn from the Texas blackout. Welcome, Allison. 
Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, David. I'm thrilled to join you today. Thank you. Well, over the past month, there's been a tremendous amount of press and so-called expert discussion about what happened in Texas. And I'm interested, I'm sure you've read a lot of it. What do you think the news coverage and the commentary has gotten wrong? And, and what do you wish there was more focus on? What are people missing? Um, well, there has, there has been a lot of, I'm gonna be, I wanna be an expert when I grow up, but I'm probably not there yet. So I appreciate all the people who are sharing their great expertise in the press every day with us. Um, it's always dangerous to hypothesize without actual data. And one of the things that I'm looking forward to is that there, that NERC and FERC come across with a significant amount of what actually happened, where, what time, et cetera. That's what makes a difference between um, intelligent hypotheses and absolutely sound analytical conclusions. So what I'm gonna to try to offer today are, are more intelligent hypotheses based on experience in Texas and with other blackouts. Um, with respect to less obvious issues that are flat wrong or underexplored, here's a couple of the stuff that I don't think has been sufficiently appreciated or, or understood. Um, or talked about enough. One of them is, as you know, this wasn't just a problem in Texas. We're getting all the ink because we screwed it up bigger and worse than everybody else did. But there were another million people out of power in SPP and in MISO, including in Louisiana, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Kansas, Mississippi, um, and, and many of the same problems like burst pipes and bad water supplies occurred particularly in Mississippi as well. Um, it's just that, again, those places didn't get hit as hard or, or mess this up as badly because they're attached to, to a whole rest of an interconnection. But they got the same bad weather and had many of the same human consequences, but smaller. NERC is saying, we warned you about bad weather and winterization, but they still don't have standards for winterization. And they still don't have, haven't changed the way they think about or talk about planning standards to start treating extreme weather events as though they're high impact medium frequency. Instead of treating every kind of disaster as its own precious little media, high impact low frequency issue. I haven't seen any data on natural gas production and what actually happened day to day. It's pretty clear from what limited data is available in Texas that natural gas production started freezing at the wellhead on or before February 12th, which was two days before the, the power went out. So I would like to see what happened with gas production and with collection system flows well before the electricity went out on around midnight on the 15th. I'd like to see PMU and DFR data across the bulk of ERCOT for the entire period from Sunday midday the 14th through Friday the 19th. ERCOT dropped over. Oh, I, I, PMU and DFR, would you mind? You. Um, the phaser measurement unit and um, DFR frequency. Um, I've just gone stupid on it, but it's high speed digital relay data but it's a, it's a di digital frequency record. And what it shows is we drove the entire um, US Canada blackout investigation off a fabulous set of DFR traces that track frequency and um, power flows and voltage at several points across the grid. And we have seen ERCOT frequency numbers that start at 1.23 in the morning on the 15th, but which is when they drop 10,000 megawatts of load. But by, the 50, by that time, 123, they had already lost 3,500 megawatts of generation and they dropped 10,800 megawatts of load at 1.20 a.m. What that says to me is, and so, so they dropped 10,008 in a giant chunk starting at 1.20. And then they started dropping small segments, one or two or 3,000 megawatts at a time. What that tells me is, the grid was really screwed up and there had to be significant voltage or frequency problems from the first 35,000 megawatts of generation that they lost 
well before 123. And I'd like to see what the PMU data tell us from multiple parts of ERCOT to understand what generation was getting dropped when and how load voltage and frequency were performing relative to that. Um, so there was a lot of seesawing going on between generation losses and load drops, and I'd like to understand that better. The other thing that I haven't seen explored or revealed is when did all of the customers that Texas has, ERCOT has signed up as load acting as a resource or under frequency load shed? A lot of those customers should have been dropping off well before um, 123 in the morning. And there has been no public information on that. So speaking as, as an interested geek, um, I'd like to know if we're paying all those guys a whole lot of money or you know, not paying them in order, paying them less money in order to perform as a resource. I wanna know what they did and when they did it and how they were operated um, or responded relative to the rest of us who got shut off involuntarily. One of the things that people don't understand about the Texas, people outside Texas don't know much about our market is that we have these critters called qualified scheduling entities or queasies. And a queasy is in the same way that I as an individual don't go directly into the New York Stock Exchange to trade my hundred shares of fill in the blank stock. Most of the individual generators or retail electric providers aren't operating individually in the ERCOT market. They're going through these intermediaries called queasies. And so a queasy will represent a portfolio of generation or a portfolio of customers or some package of both. So who are they? those names we would know? Like if we knew who a queasy was, would it be a name we'd recognize or is that? Oh yeah, there are an outfit like Shell will run a queasy, probably Reliant or Centerpoint is, um, probably Reliant is running a queasy that's covering all of their retail electric different arms and companies. Um, Tenasca is a gen, reps both, um, their generation and their power marketers and a bunch of the industrial customers whom they serve. So different queasies run different portfolios of generation and or power markets, marketing trading traders and or retail electric providers. And I haven't seen anybody talk about what did the queasies do and when, how did they allocate all of these costs? Were they the ones who were, who were hedging? How are they trading available power supplies or prices among the different entities that they were repping? Or what did they do when this generator in my portfolio dropped? How did I make up for it? So a lot of stuff that happens inside a queasy portfolio never gets into the market. But on the other hand, maybe it all flowed through. And that is, that is just a, so that's a sort of a, a black box is what happened inside all of those queasies. Um, what else? One of the questions everybody's talked as though this was purely a generation loss problem that led to the, the load shed. But we did have a set of storms that started on the 11th, actually start on the 11th, which was Thursday, and then rolled across and took out a bunch of distribution and some transmission. And then um, the TDUs, transmission distribution utilities, were able to bring a bunch of the customers back and the distribution and transmission facilities. But it's not clear to me yet, haven't seen any data on how many customers were still out because of distribution failures. In other words, how much worse could load have been on the 14th and 15th? And how much transmission was not, how much generation was not deliverable because of either transmission congestion or transmission inoperability of, of specific transmission segments. So, so that would be interesting to know. Um, Allison, let me yeah. follow up on one thing you just said there. The um, One of the things when, and there's been a lot of, uh, and Cheryl, I'd uh, be interested in your thoughts on this too. I, there's, there, of course, one of the things that everyone kind of rushes to in terms of this um, with an event like this is the interconnection, uh, the, the fact that ERCOT, let's leave the regulation piece uh, aside for a second, but that 
just in terms of interconnection that, uh, that we have ERCOT. We have the Eastern Interconnect, the Western Interconnect, and then we have ERCOT. Um, and Mexico. <clears throat> I'm sorry? And Mexico. Right. Um, and, the, and the fact that, uh, that there, you just mentioned about in terms of the weather and the weather situation and the fact of what that might have meant for its surrounding states. I mean, there was actually, and I always have my little props here, things, you know, because I actually do get a paper copy of the New York Times delivered to my house. And, you know, there's uh, this, this map, and this is actually in the February 17th edition, and it has this map that shows where the outages are and the number and the percentage of customers without power. And of course you can see right in the middle of there where it was there. And, and of course there, there are a chunk in New Mexico, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Mississippi, um, and also a, a, a part of the weather system up in Kentucky, Ohio, uh, West Virginia, but obviously very heavy concentration in Texas. Do you think there, um, the, the whole issue of inter more interconnection outside into and out of ERCOT, is that something that we ought to we ought to be thinking about? Is it something that actually, you know, yeah, it might have helped, but look, not gonna happen. Let's not waste any breath on it. Let's uh let's let's not not wring our hands over that. I mean, what what is the right way? I mean, really for both of you that we ought to be thinking about that or talking about it right now. I don't think grid expansion needs to happen on a massive scale nationwide. I think it's foolish to talk about interconnecting significant interconnection of Texas beyond the 860 megawatts that we have today. Um, it's foolish to talk about significant expansion of the Texas to Mexico, Western, Eastern interconnections without talking about significantly expanding all of the other it, de, transmission debt gets to those parts of the world before they connect to Texas. So I don't think that connecting Texas transmission in a vacuum is ever going to happen, nor should it. But I think I do think that Texas should be studying, ERCOT should be studying that with some objectivity. And I do think there are significant benefits to major transmission interconnections to the rest of the world, supposing the transmission in the rest of the world is beefed up as well. I think that there's no question if you look at how long it took to restore the outages in the parts of Texas and adjoining states for the most part that are in MISO and the Southwest Power Pool, having interconnections with other states helped. So you can't say it wouldn't have helped if they built it a different way. But I do think there's an over-focus right now. Um, to your first point of everyone being an expert, I saw somebody tweeted after this happened, somebody tweeted like, welcome electric grid um, experts, newly minted electric grid experts, sit down right to the brand new impeachment lawyers who just started and the armchair epidemiologists have a seat. And there's been a lot of focus on, con the, because of the SEAM study, on connecting the three big interconnections in the United States. And I get asked about it all the time. But there's so much transmission that could be built within, it's not as if we're built out within the Eastern interconnection, within the Western interconnection, or even within the regional markets, there's so much more that's needed. So that's, while it's not foolish to think of more connection, there's a lot more that has to be done. And I know that's something you testified about. Yes. Yeah, thanks. I want to add one more point to my list of peds, if I may, and then we can move on. In, in terms of sort of assertions that are making me nuts in the press, and one of them is, and maybe this isn't the press, but so much of, of the, of the um, chattering classes rather than the broad press, and that is the assertion that you can do mass cuts, load cuts, or rotating outages using smart meters. I'm pretty sure that we're good at doing smart meters one or two or one circuit at a time, but I'm also very sure that we don't have the communications bandwidth or the IT programming or the quality of customer data to be able to do that on, on including linkages of this customer to this meter number to this circuit to this load that are accurate and validated so that we can do, so that somebody who is sitting on top of connectivity to smart meters could actually do massive load cuts. 
And I'm pretty sure that we would screw that up in a big way and put a lot of critical customers and medical needs customers and other people out of service. So the opportunity to go wrong there is much greater than the opportunity to go right. I'm also not convinced that when you turn somebody off with a smart meter all the way that you can turn them back on easily, particularly when you're doing it in bulk. So I think there's a lot more to be studied there. And I'm not sure that 2009 vintage smart meters are gonna be good for that purpose. You know, I want to come back to that in a second, Allison, a little bit later on in, uh, in uh, kind of uh, our discussion here, kind of a, a, some more discussion about the, um, the kind of the load side of what we're thinking about here. And, uh, and uh, there are di different aspects of that. And I want to circle back uh, around to that here in a minute. But first, let me ask you just, um, just in terms of you've identified a whole number of things that um, that that we need to, to get to the bottom of. Um, and additional uh, information, additional uh, data, and, and there, there are, of course, other ones in addition to just the ones that you, you were talking about. You, uh, you helped lead the team that investigated the causes of the 2003 blackout. In fact, that's where you and I first met um, back uh, now 18 years ago, almost 18 years ago. And um, when I was there at DOE and you were um, uh, helping lead that effort along with Jimmy Glotfelty and a number of others, the, but you really had a, had a really key leadership role in making that happen and really producing the authoritative report on the causes of the 03 blackout. And, and then that report helped lead to enactment of the 2005 Energy Policy Act. And really was, it really was widely recognized as the authoritative report on the causes and, and really had a, had a really authoritative list of recommendations, a number of which were, were acted upon by the Congress and by regulators. Um, what, how do you, uh, and, and yet I, I haven't myself seen any sort of, and well, in that case, one of the things about it was uh, that, that helped were, was that uh, DOE in terms of helping take take the lead on that with, with you in the lead on it. Um, the, we didn't really have regulatory jurisdiction. I mean, it hadn't been a part. It wasn't the economic regulator. It was, it really kind of stood apart. So it wasn't in the position of sort of defending itself. And, and you and the other lead writers weren't in the position of saying, well, you're trying to defend a decision that you had, had put in place, which really, I think, lent a lot to the credibility of the report. I haven't seen that happen yet this time. It seems like a lot of the investigations that are going on are people that are either regulators that had a role in, in actions um, or, and so, I don't know, you know, blame is, is often, you know, is much easier to give than to take. And, um, and I don't know, sort of what, what is your, your take? I mean, what should we be doing now in terms of actually getting an authoritative investigation and, and an authoritative set of, uh, of facts as to what ought to be done, what actually happened, and then what actions could be taken now? That, that's an important question. FERC and NERC are conducting an investigation. Um, they have obviously skin in the game, so I hope, I have confidence, I have optimism that they will be able to take a tough look in the mirror at their respective agencies' roles when it comes to root cause analysis, because some of their predecessors or members made some of the decisions that led to, or made some of the non-decisions that contributed to, to the, this current disaster, like insufficient winterization, or not taking enough responsibility for gas delivery. Um, or for how do you count on the, how do you treat the capacity of um, renewable resources in a winter storm? Those, are, those all could have had significantly more work or significantly more accountability. And I am optimistic that FERC and NERC will dive deep into those issues and have a well-protected group of of investigators who were told exactly what I was told by my boss, Pat Wood at FERC, which is you tell the truth no matter what it is and no matter who it hurts. That's, that's, that is what the job is for this investigation. And Pat and, and Spencer Abraham, Secretary of Energy at the time, went to great pains to protect us as the investigation team from 
in terms of always knowing that our North Star was find out what happened and tell the truth. And I am optimistic that the current management of FERC and NERC will say the same to their to their staffs, investigators who have been called in. Um, I am I not as true. optimistic about the Texas Commission, which is doing an investigation or about ERCOT or about the Railroad Commission, the Texas Reliability Authority, the ledge. There's not, there is more smoke than light in a lot of those organizations. And there's not a lot of grownups left in many of those organizations right now. So it, it is hard to tell whether they will be able to, and most of the Texas agencies aren't sharing any information at all with the public. So I don't know whether they will be cooperating with the FERC NERC investigation in terms of sharing data that would inform a root cause analysis. I share your optimism that FERC will take a hard look at it. Um, and, you know, if I could go in a time tunnel back to 2011, um, well, I would do a lot of things different maybe, but one of them <laughs> is maybe FERC could have been a little more muscular about ordering the preparation of a weatherization standard. Um, something I think Chairman Glick has signaled they may do this time. Uh, at that time, FERC had never ordered the preparation of a standard. They later on my watch did it three times on geomagnetic disturbances, physical security and supply chain risks and cybersecurity. And um, it would have been tough to do it in the Texas case, given the Texas politics and all. But, you know, again, 20 with 2020 hindsight, I think FERC could have been more muscular. But FERC has a lot of authority over the reliability standard part. Do they have the ability, do you think, to get all that single phaser data and all the queasies and the other um, things you said in the beginning that you wish you had? Because that's some of that is more markety than reliability standards, right? I I know all of the things like PMU data is entirely reliability, and NERC has jurisdiction to the degree that you call it jurisdiction. NERC ERCOT has to comply with NERC requirements, and ERCOT's utilities have to comply with NERC requirements. So yeah. this is completely is under FERC, the Texas Reliability Entity. That's in the two the in the Allison Act, the two thousand and five Act. The other thing I'll say about that is even uh, I mean, to the extent there was any wrinkle on that, I mean, the, the DOE information collection authorities are incredibly broad, incredibly powerful. Um, and so whatever whatever gaps are, if, if there were any in getting that data, I, I, I'm very confident that the, the information collection authorities that DOE has would, would, would cover it. Um, I mean, you know, on, uh, Actually, Cheryl, I mean, this is a question that's a little bit down our list, but just because it plays off of just uh, or kind of follows up on something you just said there, Allison. I mean, the a lot of the players here um, have been um, kind of uh, either either marched off or driven off or or they wrote ridden off um, into the sunset um, uh, in terms of the ERCOT leadership, the unaffiliated members of the ERCOT board. Uh, members of the Public Utility Commission of Texas, um, a lot of key players have, have, have well, they're gone. Um, wh what, uh, what's your view about um, uh, their, are they going to be replaced? How long is that going to take? I mean, what's your, uh, do you have, have, a, have a thought about what happens next on that front? I have thoughts and they're not particularly optimistic. I don't think the ritual sacrifice phase of this disaster is over yet. Um, remember that, that we have already decapitated ERCOT and, and we have had um, the PUC members walk the plank and we, but lots of editorial pages are calling out the governor, the Lieutenant governor and the attorney general for doing so little to warn or respond after the grid failed. And there are finger pointing even among the, the leadership of the Texas ledge and the um, governor and lieutenant governor and attorney general about whose fault is it that, you know, we should be unwinding the dollars, which is a nightmarish task that took, that, that took FERC and all of the lawsuits that followed the Western market meltdown in 2001. FERC was still doing that 15 years later and the courts. So I don't think that um, 
So the, the sort of financial recriminations and untangling are going to take years. But remember that in California, Governor Gray Davis was, was essentially fired from office because of his role perceived or real in causing the California market meltdown. And there are a lot of editorial writers who think that it's Greg Abbott's turn as the, as the Texas governor. I, I think, um, you know, speaking admiringly, Gray Davis has more lives than any cat I've ever seen. I mean, Greg Abbott has more. And, and so I don't think this is what's going to do him in. But know that the mood here is not good. At the same time, though, let's look at how easy it will be to replace all of these people. Good board members don't grow on trees. And the fact that, that our politicians are pounding the table and saying only Texans are qualified to understand what happened and to give us good advice on this is a recipe for disaster because I'm pretty sure that um, there's an awful lot of people with great experience and creativity and insight who have been through things like cold weather and competitive market issues outside Texas who could make or cut do better, help or cut do better. I am quite confident that um, who in his or her right mind would wanna be a PUC commissioner now? How do you unwind all these problems? Especially if everybody's shooting at you. It takes a pretty big set of skills and a pretty tall pair of boots to walk into that pit full of snakes and think that you can turn it around. So my hat's off to anyone who's willing to take the job and, um, and my hopes and prayers and thoughts go out to them. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things that's most bothered me is the departure of people from the scene because, you know, people from Michigan and Maine might actually be helpful if you're trying to figure out what to do about cold weather, for example. But I want to pick up a question that was in the Q&A that I know relates to something that um, you've talked a lot about, which is the question is there's been so much talk about why the Houston skyscraper stayed lit and how could that have been done better and what all was going on on the distribution end. And I think there's a lot of lessons to unwind there, I think. Could you uh, talk about that a little? Sure. This is, as, as you mentioned and I mentioned, when the Texas distribution utilities took the list of the known critical facilities like hospitals and um, government emergency operations centers and so on and so forth and, and plotted out those circuits and said, these are the ones I know I need to protect. They then started turning off everybody else and they ran out of load to cut who wasn't on those giant circuits. And there are an awful lot of office buildings and an awful lot of rich people, frankly, sitting in neighborhoods around all of those critical facilities. So every Texas paper was full of photos from a whole lot of dark out in the suburbs, looking at a city skyline full of lit up office buildings. And by the way, part of the reason all those office buildings were lit up was because the roads were impassable for days. And they'd say, I, I called the guy who's in charge of turning off the lights for that building, but he can't get there and we can't do it remotely. So one of the most important lessons for me, and clearly the fact that you couldn't rotate the outages is what caused so much misery for so many people. It's a lot easier to sit in the dark for two to four hours at a stretch in the cold and then rotate it to someone else. That's how you keep your house warm. That's how you keep your food cold. That's how you keep your pipes from burst, freezing up. But the fact that so many homes froze for four days straight because there was no one else to dump the pain of the outage on is what caused so much human misery and death in this circumstance. So, I have several recommendations about how to address that. The most important is I would like to see all of the, when I say I would like to see, that's a very polite way to say we should mandate this. Um, I, I think we should be requiring every distribution utility in the nation to go back through and reassess how their transmission and distribution, distribution circuits are designed. 
And I think they should be installing much better sectionalization and routing capabilities so that you can do much more granular division of your circuits to put significantly less load around every critical facility and to be able to rotate. It's like the difference. If you have to share a pizza and you cut it into four slices, that's going to serve a lot fewer people than if you cut the pizza into 12. Aren't so they doing to be done this summer. right now? Uh, for example, with the wildfires, they're doing a lot of rerouting the distribution lines, but, but somebody has to pay for that, right? The regulator has to say, we will allow you to put in your rates to do that, and then the companies will go do it. But a lot of it isn't. It starts with putting in the devices to do sectionalization at both transmission and at distribution level. The, the trick is, and those devices aren't super expensive. You have to do good engineering and you have to figure out where to divvy up your grid and how to serve different pieces of it in different ways. But that's an engineering problem. It's not a massive capital investment problem and it doesn't require total redesign. So that's piece number one. Piece number two is I would like to see some kind of emergency requirement, requirement under emergency circumstances that every major um, commercial load in particular and some industrial loads, but particularly like office buildings, um, that you be able to, that, that we mandate that they have the remotely actuated capability to shed 30 to 50% of non-essential load in that as a human needs, capability so that I don't have to put put a maintenance guy in a truck on a dangerous road in order to keep an extra 10 megawatts for somebody. The third thing that I think is really important given the, um, the prevalence of grid disasters, whether from T and D extreme weather, from flooding, from, from storms, whatever, is I think we need to start making critical facilities more resilient on their own. If we have human and economic and social needs, depending on the fact that our water systems can keep producing water and our wastewater systems don't spill and that our hospitals can keep the lights on and keep, keep doing clean water and heat and that kind of thing, then I think every fire station and jail and hospital and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, including you know, phone company towers and central offices and stuff, all of those things should start having mandatory backup power systems. They have to be clean. They have to have PV and storage and diesel generation, clean diesel or propane or CHP, because I don't think you really want natural gas competing for critical facilities at the same time that it's supposed to be keeping people warm. Allison, uh, let me just, if I can ask you just one follow-up on that. And the, there, there were, uh, this, this is um, along the lines of one of the questions in the chat. I mean, do you think that that's uh, on some of the things that you were just suggesting about, um, uh, for, for example, uh, remote uh, non-critical load shedding capability, things like that. Is that something that you would say, um, that, well, that, Congress, that that could happen anywhere. I mean, these are issues that could come up anywhere. Is this, there's certainly nothing Texas specific about the, about what a uh, number of the things you were just noting. Is that something that you would say, well, that's something we really should look for Congress to act on, or we should, we should look for, for well, even FERC acting, obviously, FERC jurisdiction is limited, uh, but the, is that, or is that something that you would say, well, look, I mean, Retail uh, sales are fundamentally state jurisdictional. This is a this is a, a um, this is a, a demand issue. Individual utilities, individual public utility commissions, individual independent system operators, things like that. No, because if you leave it, yes, Congress, no states, no individual utilities, no individual state regulators. This is disasters happen everywhere. Community resilience is an essential and the, the, the resilience of critical facilities to humans and to economies and to communities is way more important than to, to take the risk of an individual regulator not paying for that or to take the risk that some states decide to be too um, willing to embrace risk. 
and to deny threat and unwilling to, to take this kinds of prevention, protection, insurance measure. This is absolutely the kind of thing that we should be doing through Congress. We should be getting FEMA and rural utility service money for it. We should be setting these things up with a certain degree of standardization in terms of, we, we've talked in the past about our frustrations with um, microgrids and how every microgrid is its own standalone science project that, you know, it's like, takes two years to design and all the pieces are crafted in Switzerland by little gnomes and then shipped over and installed by, it's crazy. This should be off the, off the shelf stuff. I mean, it's a little more complicated than buying it at Home Depot, but it's not like every jail is different or every hospital's needs are different or every water and wastewater treatment plant is different. DOE has to stop paying people to do science projects and start making these production grade, commercial, scalable, chink, chunk, 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 put every single one out with a standard set of instructions, a standard contract, standard communications, standard dispatchability protocols and performance requirements, emissions requirements. All of this stuff should be off the shelf, including the um, engineering and installation assessment and the rules for the individual critical facility about what size do you need? I mean, they could be a little more com complicated than a Model T, but it should be fundamentally be how big do you need it? When do you want me to pull it up to your loading dock? And the most valuable thing we could do for this is not only protect the critical facilities, but also make all of these communications accessible, interoperable, and dispatchable so that we can use them for resource adequacy, voltage support, ramping, et cetera, when we are in emergency conditions. There's a fire station, and by the way, there are fire stations and hospitals and cop shops and water and wastewater treatment plants across the country. So it's a good way to get these kind of distributed resources out where they'll help the grid and where they'll be an economic asset as well as an operating asset. I want to turn to the, the generation side a little bit. There's one, one phenomenon you always see when things happen is that um, people who are selling things come forward with solutions. And we've got three questions in the chat about the Warren Buffett proposal to that this could be helped, if I understand it, with a whole new fleet of gas plants and gas storage. But I mean, I'm, I haven't studied it closely. I, I thought they had a lot of gas plants and they're sitting on top of the Permian Basin and a lot of shale. So can we not address it through rules for how the gas system and the electric system work? Do we really need more gas infrastructure in Texas? I'm interested in your thoughts on that. I have not read the Warren Buffett proposal. Um, I haven't even seen the articles about the Warren Buffett proposal. We have a lot of gas plants in Texas. We have a lot of gas storage in Texas. Um, the people who write rules in Texas are reluctant to put them on the gas side. They're also reluctant on gas production and pipelines. They're also reluctant to put rules on contract, on, on, on generation. It seems to me that the first way to address the performance issue is to do the kinds of to pay premium prices for premium performance. And I think it's a lot going to be a lot faster and more politically saleable to start creating contractual relationships for delivered gas certainty than it will be. And I think that's probably gonna be cheaper um, than it will be to, to go through the political battles of trying to create new regulations in Texas. So you're talking. But there, I'm sure there's a lot of people who are willing to take Warren Buffett's money, though. So you need the capacity market to do that, or can you just do things in the existing markets to require more firm gas and more performance requirements and things? Um, I don't think a capacity market would make a difference here in ERCOT. We clearly didn't lose the grid because we didn't have enough generation mm -hmm. capacity. We lost the grid because most of that generation didn't produce it when it, when we needed it. But a capacity market can put on rules that require and and pay for preparation. In other words, it, there was plenty of capacity. They didn't have a, not enough plants. But one thing you can use a capacity market as a vehicle to impose more performance requirements and um, 
require people to ha be ready to run if they're getting paid to be there. There are other ways to do that besides a capacity market, but. Um, a capacity market, it pretty clearly moves a whole lot of money from customers wallets into generators wallets without guaranteeing that those generators produce effectively. Given the current uproar in Texas over the, um, what is viewed as stealing wealth from customers to pay unclear amounts to both generators and gas providers, those who are left standing, it's unclear to me that you'll get much enthusiasm for paying even more without the guarantee that they'll deliver. I think it's a different way of structuring the payment. I think it probably would have some benefits, but I, I agree that it's probably not where they're gonna go because everyone who ever argued for an energy only market in Texas, which is a lot of people are now explaining why they were right and that wasn't the problem. I mean, I think David has ideas on this too. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I, my my own view about that is it it certainly isn't true. It certainly is true that a capacity market in itself wouldn't necessarily solve the problem. But to me, it's a question about whether or not the capacity market is designed the right way. I mean, I think that after the uh, that 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 a well designed capacity market actually can do a lot to address the issue, at least potentially. I mean, after the polar vortex up in the Northeast, it, it was the case where even in the, the context of capacity markets, there was a bunch of capacity that had been paid, had gotten capacity payments, but had didn't show up. Well, you know, FERC, and in fact, Cheryl, I think this was when you were on the commission, I believe when a lot of this was going on, the, um, the, uh, the ISOs then addressed that through capacity performance, um, uh, well, essentially, I think that that was the name of PJM's uh, proposal, wasn't it? Capacity performance, um, essentially to put in uh, very uh, strict performance requirements and heavy penalties for capacity. I mean, the other thing you can do, of course, with a, or capacity that had, been, had received a capacity payment and then didn't show up. I mean, the other thing, of course, with a capacity market you can do is you can you can look at uh, look at different um about what your capacity performance is going to be at different periods of the of the year and receive different differential payments based on when you expect that capacity perform I mean, i think the there at least in the energy only market of course the idea is that can be captured through an energy price um but um as we as we of course could see there were instances where uh, that that even I'm sure every generator that could run at 9,000 bucks a megawatt hour was trying to run. It's just that a whole bunch of them and capture that. But it's just that, that obviously for various reasons, a lot of them could. And, and let's be clear that the current MOPR and other debates today make clear that those who support capacity markets haven't yet got all the bugs worked out. <laughs> so so well, I don't think true, saying, true. Texas, it's time for y'all to do a capacity <laughs> market too is really going to sell too well down here. Well, and, and, you know, I think that it may well be the, there, the, it, it certainly is true in my, at least in my view, it's not as if a capacity market is the only way to solve it. I mean, it, it can absolutely be, uh, the, these, these, uh, I think a capacity market can mitigate it, mitigate the issues, but I do, I do think there are obviously ways that, that the issues that you were, uh, you've been talking about, Allison, as well as, uh, just some of the, the getting the capacity to actually show up when it's needed can be addressed a lot of other ways. And, and I want to be super clear here that the Texas failure, yes, all, uh, so much generation failed and lots of other things went wrong, but let us remember that there are more ways to skin this cat than just fixing supply. 90% mm -hmm. of the people on this call are probably making their living on the supply side or wringing their hands about this market or that element. But let us be clear that demand, Texas demand was fundamentally wrong. And, and it is because we have so many in, uninsulated homes that, were, that, that have holes in them. We have way too many homes with inefficient heating that contributed to almost half of the demand surge on the 14th. And, and it is looking forward at the complex nature of the grid that we operate day to day and how much harder that is gonna get. 
as we integrate more and more um, resource uncertainty and more extreme weather problems and more cyber attacks and more intermittent resources and more good stuff is sitting out in transmission queues, can't get on, and more transmission isn't getting built, the grid's getting harder and harder to operate under the best of circumstances. The cheapest and most certainly effective way to improve electric markets and electric reliability and resilience is to make demand better. Not to keep doing the whole angels dancing on the head of a pin thing about the supply side, but do stuff that we know works to fix the demand side. And that means massive amounts of energy efficiency. It means much better energy efficiency codes and appliance standards. And it means doing those nationwide starting in Texas. Allison, there's a lot of questions in the chat about weatherization and winterization of power plants, of gas supply equipment and pipelines, and you've just raised better weatherization of houses. Is that something we need to require, whether through reliability standard, a Texas law, and uh, homes efficiency standard that comes out of the DOE? Is this something we can motivate with um, you know, market structures or rebates? And especially on the gas side, is it's, it, I don't see the Texas Railroad Commission looking like they're going to change their rules. Is there any way we can get at weatherization of the gas system? That's a question we've had from several people. But I'm just interested in the whole weatherization picture. How does it happen? What makes it happen? Well, on the electric side, NERC can do that. I think NERC could also set some kind of performance standards for generation that would force generators, particularly for gas, to push through some level of um, gas performance requirement on their fuel delivery contracts, which they could push onto pipelines and to um, generate and, and to wellhead and wellhead collection systems. But I am not an expert at contracting of that nature, but I think it could be done through NERC if NERC were not run by lowest common denominator or if FERC started pushing NERC in the industry harder. One, so I think, I think there is that option unless Congress decides to go after um, winterization of at the, at the wellhead as well as at the collection system as well as on the pipeline. And on the pipeline also requiring things like um, backup power systems for pipeline like compressor stations and some of the other vulnerable portions on a pipeline. Um, so it's, it's going to take something other than waiting for a state regulator to save you, I think. What, one question on that, Allison or Cheryl, and I, I, uh, this has come up in the chat, um, and I, I, I certainly don't know the answer to this. There, there's, it's been raised about, we, we talk about winterization, weatherization of, uh, of the, of the power plants. And yet it, in some cases, there's been a concern raised that, well, if you're building a new one, fine, not that much of a, uh, of a problem. Uh, in fact, maybe the incremental cost is quite small. I don't, I don't know. Um, but, but if you're, if you're going to actually winterize or weatherize some of the facilities in Texas that weren't built that way to begin with, it is a major, major undertaking. I mean, do you, do you all, uh, what are your thoughts uh, about that? Well, I can speak from what I remember about the 2011 issue. And of course, it was a lot less cold, but it was still cold and there were outages of a smaller scale and duration. Um, there are power plants that are actually kind of some of the fundamental ma machinery is not enclosed because if you enclosed, it would be very hot in the summer. And that I believe could be quite expensive to um, enclose. It would be like taking a football stadium and putting a dome on it. It gets into heavy money. But I remember in 2011, there were some things that were relatively modest improvements with the valves. I call them valves. Maybe they have fancier names that went from the pipelines to the power plants and some relatively small things that could be done that would have helped some of the things that happened in 2011 that were not expensive. We're not like changing the whole configuration of the power plant, but really just um, insulating or changing the uh 
changing the materials of the some of the fuel delivery components in the plant. That's what I remember. I don't know, Allison, if you've looked. I have not seen data on what I haven't had time to look at all the weatherization cost data. Um, it is not cheap, particularly at the wellhead and Texas has thousands and thousands of gas wells. So I'm pretty sure we are not going to be realistically asking every one of those gas wells to put winterization on them. But we should have some sense of, of which are the ones that matter in terms of wellheads and storage and collection systems and making some strategic, figuring out a way to do some strategic expectations and requirements. Um, one of the elements of orthodoxy in Texas is, is that we built this system to perform in heat and many of the weatherization measures that are appropriate for cold winter, cold weather performance will kill productivity in the heat. So you can't just do one size fits all requirements for weatherization. A lot of the measures when every, when anybody throws off the casual, well, we have, you know, wind turbines performing in the North Sea and so and so performing in hey, Canada. The answer is, yeah, they built it that way. Yeah. And it's part of the design parameters. They don't have to retrofit that puppy. And, and as Cheryl points out, retrofitting ain't cheap and it, and it can compromise effectiveness and productivity. Well, you raise a really important point, which goes across a lot of these things, which is prioritization. I mean, we, we can't we've been talking about Texas, but the entire country and the entire world is subject to more severe weather. And we can't afford to prepare every piece of equipment that relates to our um, keeping humans healthy and warm and safe against every possible piece of weather everywhere. So you have to make some decisions. What are the things that would you really can't live without? Where do you start if you start spending money to prepare? And you, you got at this when you were talking about having some requirements for critical distribution loads and how you back up water treatment and so forth. But is that something that each distribution company should look in the mirror and take a better look at? I'm, or do we need some state rules? Is it something you think that Congress or the DOE could do something about? Because, I mean, there's never going to be enough money to do everything perfectly, yet you can't have millions and millions of people freezing with no water for a week. There has to be some way you can protect what's most important. I, I My view of this goes back to the idea that um, extreme weather threats and so many other threats that we face from um, cyber attack, EMP, um, bad guys, whatever it is, all of these have a common consequence. And that is the grid goes out and people sit in the dark. I would much rather protect people and the systems we need than try to protect against all of these individual causes. So my priority list starts with critical facilities, being able to operate on a standalone basis. It actually starts with having more imagination and planning so that we do more preparation. The, the Department of Defense at one point was hiring like science fiction writers and, and Disney creators and novelists writing, writing catastrophe stuff to think up, dream up, what are all the things that could go wrong and what should I be planning to defend the nation against in terms of weird stuff that, that we're not creative enough inside the Pentagon to think about and plan for. We need to be that level of creative and perceptive and paranoid in the electric industry instead of protecting against same old, same old, because clearly the magnitude of the threats that we face is much worse. And so we need to prepare in much different ways. So that says to me, critical facilities, um, and so what that means is we need to treat the symptoms, not just, or the consequences, not just the individual one-off threats. Um, we need to be protecting people because the same energy efficiency and repair measures that keep people healthier and warm in the winter and cool in the summer are also gonna help them better in floods. It's also gonna help them better in storm surge. It's also gonna help them better when a hurricane takes down half your, half your city. Um, 
We need to do a lot more demand flexibility because that is going to reduce our resource needs and our ramping needs and make it easier to do all the other stuff we need to do on decarbonization. And we need to do um, a lot more transmission and a lot more distributed storage and supply. Allison, I'd like to talk a little bit more about one of the points you just made there. And in fact, I was formulating this question um, about uh, trying to uh, get together a few strands of thought on it. And then you you just used the words, right? In what you just- Right, right into your hands. Yes, you did. Uh, you know, we're just, um, you know, you're, uh, which was great. Demand flexibility. I mean, one of the things that, uh, and one of the, in the chat, one of the questioners, uh, says some, uh, something along the lines of uh, why not take a more proactive approach toward curtailment? You know, for example, you know, how many people were running a pool pump um, while all this was going on? Um, Probably not many. It, well, you know, I would assume not. Um, but, you know, or, or how many people would uh, who, uh, if they had any visibility into the price climbing up to 9,000 bucks a megawatt hour would have done something different? I mean, or... Or how much, it, and, and I, but yet I take your earlier point of, well, uh, and in fact, when you and I were emailing back and forth a couple of weeks ago about, uh, well, you know, I mean, a lot of folks never figured out how to program their VCR. I mean, they never actually used the capability of their, their Nest thermostat or whatever. What makes, makes anybody think that they're actually going to start, you know, monitoring the real-time price or doing all that? And yet it seems as if, it just seems to me this whole, the, the demand flexibility point and, and to what you just said as well with a lot more of intermittent or some people call them, you know, reliably unreliable uh, resources, you know, that, uh, that aren't, aren't gonna be um, uh, dispatchable as we kind of move to a, a lower carbon future. Looking at the demand side, what we can do there will not only help improve resiliency, but will would dramatically lower the cost of decarbonization, it seems to me. I mean, what are your thoughts about what we ought to be thinking about on demand flexibility and how we ought to be really going about that? I, I am totally for it. Um, I think that, I mean, I started working on, on demand response kinds of issues way, way back in, in the late 90s and 2000. So the first thing that I want to say is I appreciate the whole prices to devices and transactive energy thing, but I don't think it needs to be that hard. And I'm pretty sure that that won't work for a whole lot of customers. Second, I'm, I'm deeply objecting to the kinds of people who say, if we had cut all of these uses, if we had, had the capability to cut all those thermostats, we would have fixed the problem or prevented the problem in the first place. It seems to me that that is taking a fairly um, inappropriately authoritative, authoritarian view of how to treat customers that I object to. When you consider the difference between prices to devices is really only going to help a few people who are super sophisticated and have a whole lot of automation. And God bless them. Let's, you know, bring it. Do that stuff. And, but a lot of times when the grid goes nuts operationally, it's too late for prices to make a difference. And it's too late for people to respond. And a lot of the demand response programs that we have today, as much as we'd like to think they're all fancy and automated, a lot of them are still sneaker net. So I believe that there is an important role for programs that are much cruder and that are triggered on grid conditions and emergency needs rather than just on pricing levels. And that you cannot do that to customers short of emergency load shed without having an explicit agreement and understanding of, like in, in, on the East Coast, there's an awful lot of demand response programs for air conditioning control, where they say, don't worry about prices. Don't worry about this or that. I'm going to give you a $10 a month discount on your bill. If you let me cycle your thermostat for a few hours, no more than 10 times over the summer for a two hour period. And you sign enough people up on that rate, but you tell them I'll never move it more than this much. 
and I won't do it more than 10 times in the summer. That is a consensual relationship. And it has a set of parameters that keep the, the cycling entity safe and that keep the customer safe. As opposed to having, you know, I don't trust someone who just wants to say, I'm going to reach out from nowhere without any prior knowledge or warning, and I'm going to kill your thermostat because the load is crashing. Not really thrilled with that, particularly if you want to do it widespread and if you want me to pay for enabling that to happen. So there, there are layers of this. We are paying an awful lot of commercial and industrial customers discounted rates to let us cycle them or cut them. Let's start doing more of that. But it needs to be with explanation and knowledge and within parameters that both sides finds constructive. Allison, I'm, I'm trying to think through some things here. So if I think of some of the messages that you've said and I've heard from other people who I trust, a couple of them are um, the message you started off with is that this is really complicated and we need to get a lot of more data to really understand it and really look at a lot of things, which is definitely true. And there's also a message that I've said myself of like, a lot of these things are related to others. And if you fix one part, it affects another part of the system. So we need to have a whole big look at it. But are there any uncomplicated things that people can start to do now? I mean, we had questions in the chat about communications with customers and preparing customers more for when weather is coming. Some of those are very low tech. I mean, but are there, are there things that are without getting all the data and without knowing everything we might wanna do with changing pricing and all are just kind of obvious lessons that people who keep the lights on anywhere should think about sooner rather than later. Yeah, Texas totally screwed up communications with customers and warning them early that this could be a disaster and conservation would be needed. Um, we did not, and, and then there was poor planning and coordin not, coordination, not only on the electric to gas thing, but about water management. I mean, one of the reasons that so many water systems ran out of enough water and, and started getting potential contaminant infiltration into their water systems was because we were told by our cities and our utilities, oh, the, there's, there's gonna be really cold, so drip water out of your faucets so that the water pipe doesn't freeze. Well, you get enough people who listen to that piece of news and have, have several water faucets dripping per household or not even dripping, but running flat out. And the next thing you know, you've got a water shortage and you're using up what's in your reservoirs and letting, and the cities are running out of enough water to serve all the customers. So that's part of how we ended up in the boil water situation for so long, apart from the, the houses where the pipes froze up and broke, which also, by the way, included a bunch of schools and stores and a lot of other places. Um, so the, the fact that they didn't do that kind of planning and coordination is a problem. The, um, the fact that the Texas utilities didn't know enough where enough of the critical facilities were that's inexcusable. Um, I, and I blame, frankly, part, in part the critical facilities because the utilities had a, had a method and all the critical facilities assumed it is obvious that I'm special and they'll take care of me or they just know about me magically. So that's I something mean, everyone can do now, right? Every distribution company can get out their feeder list, make sure they know where people are, and people who think they should be critical can check that they really are. I mean, that's yeah, but that's but also but also um, most utilities don't have up to date information on who their medically vulnerable customers are, and and discovered that too late. But the, so it's always after the disasters that people say, oh, geez, I have to fix all these things. Um, so there, there's just a lot of details like that that are nuts and bolts, keep the trains running on time that, that everybody manages to grow. The assumption that I can get parts to fix stuff that one breaks when all of your roads are impassable for days. And by the way, your airports are shut down due to bad weather. If you don't have spare parts on site and if you can't get your workers in to that site to access the parts and fix stuff, you're dead in the water. 
or frozen in the water. Can I ask both of you a question about uh, that, that? And I, I don't know whether or not this is uh, a right or not, but I read somewhere that one of the issues on the gas pipeline system was that, a, that, uh, that some of the compressors um, and, uh, and, and well, I think it was primarily compressors, the pumps had been switched to electric instead of gas to meet air quality issues. Um, and that, and that then there was obviously the problem with the electricity supply, which then caused this this whole sort of uh, sort of feedback loop, which which led to lots of problems. Is that something that you would say? Well, we ought to revisit that, or would you say, well, no, actually, um, just leave it on. Uh, they they should still be electrified. It's just that they need to be on that critical list, and that's how we'll solve that problem. Well, you, you have already heard my rant about if you think you're a critical facility, you need a backup power system, a clean backup power system. So, and, and the, all of the gas compressor stations and many other parts of pipelines and production systems are now came out and, and after their power had been shut off and said, wait a minute, I'm critical and electricity is my weatherization means. Fine, put on your big boy pants and put in a backup power system. Don't just expect everybody else to take care of you. Allison, one question I have is I, it's kind of philosophical, but how long do you think the kind of tail that we're going to be talking about this is? Because some, some events like the 2003 blackout or the Western power crisis in 2001 are like talked about for a decade. Maybe they're talked about for the wrong lessons, but people keep referring back to them to justify all sorts of decisions for a very long time. Other things like major hurricanes and floods, it seems sometimes the restoration work happens right where it happened and even hundreds of miles away, which obviously could be subject to the same weather patterns, the, uh, the, the hardening doesn't happen in the same way and we don't really learn from it except very localized. I mean, this is already fading from the front page, but how do we make sure we, do you have any thoughts about, I, I guess maybe it's, it's a NERC, it's a FERC, it's an EEI or the Gas Association, how do we keep learning from it and not just kind of think, phew, I'm glad I'm not Texas, that didn't happen to me, now I'm gonna move on and live my life. Because that's a real problem, I think, that we don't learn enough from some of these things as we should, and we wait for it to happen again in a different place. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. I think it depends on who you want to keep talking about it and what you want them to learn from it. I expect that the NERC and industry work on what do I do about natural gas? I think that particular issue about the gas fuel interface is going to have a long tail and a lot of attention. I think that the sort of market design and economics community is going to be um, licking their chops over the and and you know holding webinars for for the next five years over what do we learn from this and who was right and who was wrong. Um, and I think that the lawyers who are going to be doing all of the pleadings in courts and in bankruptcy courts and in class action lawsuits and in you owe me for this kind of price gouging kind of thing, that's going to go on for 10 years. Um, beyond that, I don't know. But human beings um, taking money they might have put aside for a new car and buying a backup generator instead, you know, if they're lucky enough to have that kind of money, which there's obviously people who are energy poor and don't have that choice. But human beings making different decisions, distribution companies remote from Texas making a decision to look hard at their feeder maps. I worry that... Uh, it's, we have to work to keep that top of mind. There's a tendency to want to not think about it and not think it could happen to you. Correct. And, and for if you're Con Ed with Hurricane Sandy and all of the work that they've done on resilience, I, I expect that the California utilities and some of the New York utilities are going to be all over this kind of recommendation. Some of the others, not so much until it's their disaster. 
Can we go uh, back to the subject of efficiency for a minute, Allison? Um, the you in your testimony yesterday um, in the House of Representatives addressed um, the, the issue of, of efficiency and improving efficiency. And and one of the things you 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 touched upon there, um, and the, that you and I have, have spoken about um, in other places, are is the fact of how so much of this hits the low and middle income folks the hardest, um, how they pay more to begin with. Um, and, and certainly as a, as a share of their income, they absolutely do. But even, but even in, uh, but even in just absolute terms, a lot, of, a lot of times they do. And then things like this hit them, hit them extremely hard. Um, if, and, and in a lot of cases are in the least efficient uh, housing as well. One of the, you, you talked about this yesterday in your testimony. Can you talk a little bit just about what you think the kind of some of the pathways should be that we ought to be thinking about efficiency, how it is that we can improve the, that, and, and actually, of course, not un, unimportantly, who needs to pay for it? We know from decades of study of and trying to develop utility energy efficiency programs that there are massive barriers to low income and multifamily to, to delivering efficiency to low income and multifamily housing, most of all, and to renters, which is all almost all poor people, because um, they don't have the means or the knowledge or the influence or the access to be able to identify all of the energy efficiency measures that could improve their house to a level that protects them and their health and their energy budget. Um, and landlords certainly are not sufficiently um, motivated to spend money on other people's behalf if they don't think they're gonna get it back in rent. So energy efficiency is always undelivered relative to its return to low income rental and multifamily housing. And yet that is the place where we could make the, where there is the most waste of electricity and of carbon and the place where investments in energy efficiency could have the biggest impact on human health, on jobs, on income, on economic development, on tax base and, and on decarbonization. So if I were um, queen of all things energy and energy investment, I would be mandating like a 20 to 50 fold increase in investment, probably of federal dollars, but also um, utility ratepayer dollars in um, massive energy efficiency retrofits that include repairs because it's stupid to put insulation on a, on a house that has a leaky roof and terrible windows. So that we actually are doing things that help these people stay healthier and keep them from having, you know, houses that get all moldy and gross and, and threaten their lives and, and their health and, and they, they end up in the emergency room. So we pay for them there too. Um, and there is income that they can't spend on rent because they're spending it on, on electric bills. I, you know, this, this actually is one of the things where um, there, I, I'm not sure how many people, there, there's always a lot of, of talk about, uh, about people having to balance their um, uh, the low income folks or, or on very limited means having to balance paying their rent and buying their food. But you don't hear as often the fact of what energy poverty actually is, and that, and what it is that about how the the hit that people are taking with every month with their electric and gas bill, and how there's a, a lot of folks that that wind up having to balance between paying their rent and paying the paying that bill, and will sometimes not pay that bill because of a shut off moratorium, but then trying to trying to balance it. There's just a I, I think there is so much that we um we actually could do on that and, and how we need more of a focus on what actually can be done to help uh, help just lower the cost, not, not try to figure out, okay, how it, is, how it is we give people more money to pay high bills? No, I mean, how about figuring out how it is that we get, uh, figure out ways to reduce, reduce the bill? I yeah, think- and, Well, I, I want, let's be super clear, LIHEAP and weatherization assistance programs do not pay for 
the level of retrofit that we need and they don't pay for repairs. Right. And, and if we need, if we want, if we are serious about achieving our nation's decarbonization goals at a rapid pace, this is the place that we need to start. And if we're serious about creating jobs and about creating equity, this is the place that we need to start. You know, one other thing I'll just add on that topic. I mean, I know when I was at DOE and I, I don't know what the, 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 I'm sure there's more, there are more recent studies on this, more recent data, but, uh, but there, were, there were studies that, that said what it is the, uh, the discount, where even people who could afford various efficiency improvements or, or paying an incremental amount for a more efficient appliance for retrofitting their windows, whatever it might be, the discount rate they apply to that, the payback period they, they want and which will, how they will base their decision is an incredibly high discount. You know, I mean, it's sort of, well, you know, look, if it doesn't pay back in three years, I'm not going to do it. I, 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 that's probably not the right number. I don't remember the number, but it's an incredible, it's a much shorter period of time than the useful life of whatever that thing is that they're making a decision about, which if that's right, and that's what the, the, uh, I remember seeing some, some of the, the information about that at the time, it really speaks to their, their more of a need for codes and things like that than trying to, or, or you can of course try to do that in some cases through pricing, a price mechanism, um, but, the, but you have to actually, uh, you can't just count on folks to sort of apply the right discount rate to that, to that energy efficiency improvement. And, and that, that does not apply to, to, to lower income people or to renters. The fact of the matter right, is exactly. the right. number of non-low income people who, um, who actually think about that you know, energy efficiency is not for most of us in the top 20 of, right. of list of things that we give a damn about day to day. No, and, it, and so it will never rise above the fact that my car needs a repair or my kid next, that needs to get to a soccer game. Right. No, and your, right. your point about the multifamily housing and things like that, of course, those are those are ones where, where the person paying the uh, paying the monthly bill is not the same person that's making the decision about what insulation or HVAC system the building has. And, and these need to be done by Congress through federal programs because we cannot wait for state utility commissions to change the archaic cost benefit test rules that dictate how, what programs they decide to, that the utility is allowed to offer or to change the rate at which they allow utilities to do them. And, and there's way too many people in energy policy and energy misery today whom we need to help in order to, to as an equity issue and as a decarbonization issue. And the other thing I would say about energy efficiency is this is a pipe dream, but every time someone puts PV on her roof or a battery on her garage without first doing energy efficiency, pissing away money and pissing away resources so that we cannot, we should not be doing a massive electrification plan without first doing energy efficiency on every host facility. Allison, I think I wanna ask one last question and then have David close. The time has flown by. I'm glad you brought up decarbonization because I think obviously that's what is driving a lot of energy policy, both micro policy and how we do energy efficiency programs and macro policy of what we put on the grid. And I worry that people are going to draw the wrong lessons from Texas and somehow be pushed more like we need more fossil fuels and more fuel in the tank and so forth and not, um, and be pushed more, there's a tough balance between spending more money to protect against storms that may be related to the changing climate and actually trying to mitigate the changing climate. And I, it seems like efficiency and some of the things you're talking about are where those meet because they both help climate adaptation and they help climate mitigation. But I wonder if you have any thoughts on that because that's been was one of the first set of, um, hot takes we heard in the immediate aftermath of like, well, of course it was caused by the wind turbines. No, it wasn't caused by the wind turbines. It was caused by the gas, but, and, and so forth and so on. Do you have any thoughts about how this is going to affect the decarbonization journey in Texas or elsewhere? 
because I don't think it should. I think it should affect how we think about it, but not whether we think about it. But I, I, in Texas, I don't think it's going to affect the decarbonization journey much. The way the Texas market is designed, it's the cheapest resource that, that wins. And today the cheapest resource is going to be some combination of um, wind, solar, and solar, wind, wind, solar, and storage. And, and gas is going to be needed for a long time, but it's gonna get harder and harder to make money at running a gas plant. Coal is, is pricing itself out of the market because most of those plants aren't efficient enough to compete and they're not being run long enough to, to, to make their, their bucks back. So I think Texas will, um, Wind and solar will keep winning for reasons that don't have a lot to do with reliability, but have everything to do with dollars. And that will be good for decarbonization. I don't know how good it'll be for keeping the lights on, but I think that's the way we've set up this system. Um, that's why we require higher level policy thinking about what else to do on decarbonization and how to deliver the benefits of decarbonization that help everybody, not just wind and solar producers. Well, well, Allison, I want to- We've run out of time, so I'm not gonna ask another question, but thank you very much. And I'll let my partner in crime here take us out. Yeah, there, are, there are a lot more questions we could out, ask Allison, but greatly appreciate you spending the last uh, 90 minutes with us here. Um, and uh, we also wanted to thank our audience for tuning in. Again, Allison, thank you very much. We, it's, uh, it's been a terrific session. As um, we mentioned earlier, the full video recording of this event will be available on the Center on Global Energy Policies website in a few days. I also uh, want to make sure everybody knows about our third session of uh, Columbia Energy Straight Talk that Cheryl and I will be hosting on Thursday, April 29th from 4 to 5.30 p.m. Eastern. I invite everybody uh, to register for that on our website. And I'm happy to announce that our guest on April 29th will be Mary Nichols, Mary is widely recognized as one of the most influential environmental regulators in American history, and we will have a lot to talk about that day. I'm also uh, very glad to note that uh, just today it was announced that Mary will be joining uh, us at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University as a newly appointed Distinguished Visiting Fellow. And so Cheryl and I are, are uh, very happy and pleased to be welcoming her as a colleague as well. For a full calendar of upcoming events, please visit the Center on Global Energy Policies uh, website. And uh, thank you again for joining us today. Have a good evening. Thanks, everybody. Well, thanks, Allison, David. Thanks, everyone.